All right, here we go. Today we have NBA champion Glenn Big Baby Davis. Welcome to Vlad TV. What's up, Vlad? Hey, man, we finally did it. We finally <laughs> did it. I'm finally here, man. Baton Rouge's finest is in the building. Yes, sir. Uh, most definitely. And we'll get into the, the whole Baton Rouge thing in a minute. Yeah. In a minute, and your connection with Boosie and everything mm -hmm. else like that. But it's your first time here. I want to start in the very beginning. So, so did you grow up in, in Baton Rouge or, or New Orleans? I grew up in Baton Rouge. Okay. Yeah. Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, it's kind of like Midtown, right? Um, you know, tough neighborhood, crazy, you know, kind of same as South Baton Rouge, you know, I know you, but, um, you know, that's where I'm from. And you have two sisters. Yes, I have two sisters. Okay. You said you never saw your sister lose a fight. Never. <laughs> Three girls, don't matter. Don't matter. They, they, they taking, they, they whooping ass. Whooping ass. No question. <laughs> that, that's where you got your toughness from what I understand. Like dead ass, because yeah. I didn't have any brothers, mm -hmm. and um, you know, not having any brothers and uh, was kind of tough. You know what I mean? I had to play with my sisters all the time, but my sisters were like the toughest people I knew. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like they was fighting before me. You know what I mean? So uh, yeah, my oldest sister, my youngest sister, I'd never seen them lose a fight ever. Hmm. Your mom, uh -huh. she was actually a former uh, high school basketball star. Yeah, she also did track. Yeah. Softball. Yeah. Majorette. Yeah. And uh, she had a modeling career. Yeah, she as did. As well. But then things kind of started to go off track at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how were you, you were the, the youngest or where were you in terms of siblings? Well, I was in the middle. In the middle. Okay. Right. And so my mom didn't think she could have kids when she had my older sister. So like 11 years, me and my older sister are apart. Ah. So, um, you know, my mom had a, you know, she was an athlete. You know what I mean? She was a majorette, you know, great softball player. She was tr tremendous at softball. Um, track, broke records. Um, but uh, she fell into a different lifestyle. Yeah. And, um, you know, for example, she dated Rick James for three years. Wait, wait, wait. Your mom <laughs> dated Rick James? Yeah. like she used Super to date, freak. Yeah. She was the first motherfucker to bring Rick James to the hood. Wow. Yeah. That's she, crazy. She was one of them. Any any Rick James stories that she told you about? Because I I read his book. Like he was Rick James was crazy in real life. Yeah, she was just you know one of his you know his things. You know <laughs> what I mean? And she like you know he liked it her like you know what I mean. Right. So she she used to bring Rick James to the hood. I feel like so many people I interview have a Rick James story. Like I just interviewed Snow, you know the the reggae artist from uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. from Toronto, and he was like his babysitter used to date Rick James. Rick James used to show up to his house, <laughs> like you know, with the babysitter. Like everyone got a Rick James story. Yeah, he just yeah. pops up everywhere. We're talking about Canada, like yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. Rick James was everywhere. Uh huh. My mom was real hood famous. She uh -huh. was real hood famous. Okay, you know what I mean? She was she was really popular in my hood. But then the drugs yeah. started playing a role in her life. Yeah, uh, she was part of that, you know, that 80s when crack, you know, really was potent. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, and sometimes you fall into the wrong people, relationships, and people make you, you know, you know, you go into different habits. And it was hard to kick for a second. You know what I mean? It was hard to kick for a second for her. But uh, in spite of her drug habits, she's always been to every game. You know what I mean? Like... I can remember times when, you know, I'm running touchdowns and I can see her in the the creek in the back going crazy, full of drugs, but her and her junkie friends back in the creek having their own little party back there while I'm running touchdowns and shit like that. So, you know, drugs never kept my mom from loving us. It just kept her away, you know? Well, I mean, I have drug addicts. Uh -huh. Actually, crack addicts in, in my family. Uh, and... I've heard like horror stories yeah. about kids being in that lifestyle. What do you think was the worst thing that you experienced while your mom is trying to kick the habit, but she's still using? Um, I think the the worst thing I think I've ever experienced is just my mom has a, was a special lady and her love was just contagious. So, when somebody goes into, you know, that deep zone like that, into that, you know, you know, 
they're missed extremely much, right? That person that that's a bright light, that's always around, that's always loving, caring. Um, you miss that person. Um, and those are the things that you miss. Those are the hurtful things. Those are the things, you know, you question God. Why? Why is she making this decision over us? Or, you know, why is she doing this over us? But my mom was fighting demons. Yeah. You know what I mean? Being abused, you know, uh, going through all types of situations growing up, not being loved by her mother. Um, you know, she was dealing with things and, you know, she slipped up, you know, and uh, it made me stronger, you know, character. Yeah. Do I have some gaps from it? Yeah. Do I have some issues? But it definitely made me stronger into who I am today. Well, and then your dad. Uh-huh. You didn't actually meet him until your sophomore year in high school? Yeah. Well, my dad, um, it's so crazy how this shit is. My mom was such a gangster. You know, my mom, I didn't know who my dad was. You know, uh, my original dad, um, that my mom, they loved my mom. My, my, original, my dad, the Davis name, he loved my mom so much that when she was pregnant with me, he was like, I don't care. You know what I mean? And so that's why I have a younger sister that's like 16 months younger than me. And so that guy adopted me, the Davis name. But then come to find out, you know, I'm getting taller. He's 5'11". I'm 6. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 6'5". <six, five. laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's, you know, that's not my dad, you know. And so, you know, I go through a period of time when I'm becoming this athlete and my mom's trying to find me some money because she didn't want me to go without. And so... You know, some guy that was acting like he was my dad at the time, like, hey, you know, that's your dad. You know, knowing damn well that's not my dad, you know? And so I, I, I go into another relationship with a dad that I, you know, he's really not my father. My mom just doing that just to make sure my kid can go to school and he's the best athlete now. He want, She want me to have the best things. So, you know, I go through that period and then, you know, my mom tells me, you know, hey, this is your real father. And I'm like, John Greer. And he was like, you know, when I looked, when I first looked at him, I was like, that's my dad. I got his nose. I got his eyes. I like, that's him. Is he big? Um, he was like 6'4". Okay. Big. And so um, I just remember vaguely like a guy coming up to the gate, big guy. And I just remember he had a blue Cadillac. And that's all I remember of him. And so... When my mom said, hey, this is your dad, seven days later, he died. Oh. My real father. How did he die? He died at heart attack in his own house. Like, just, he he was living by himself, and, you know, nobody was really watching him. And Damn. He died by a heart attack. So, you met him one time? One time. And then seven days later, he died? Well, no, no. I met him one time when I was little, but I never met him when I was a dog. Oh, so, okay. So the whole thing about meeting him in sophomore year, that, that didn't happen. No. Okay, no, I messed no, that no, up. No, okay, no. my bad. But so you that's, when I, that's when I found out all the information. And then, you know, I got to the league. And then my mom was like, yo, this your dad. And I was like, all right. And seven later, he died, literally. Yeah. That was crazy. Okay. Well, as a kid, you were you were huge. <laughs> yeah. At, at nine years old, you were five, six, 160 pounds. <laughs> I was a big kid. Big ass kid. And you were actually too big to play uh, Pee Wee football. Yes, I was. You know, you were the right age. I was right. <laughs> not the right size. Not the right size. And it was crazy because that's where I got the name Big Baby from. Mm-hmm. Right? So I used to play for the South Baton Rouge Rams. And... My mom went to jail in Maryland. Um, my grandmother came and got us. And, um, you know, my grandma was like, yo, put him in, you know, my mom was like, put him in football. Like, he's really, really good, you know? And so um, I had to play peewee, but I was too overweight. So my weight was the seniors. So that was the older guys. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, I was a baby on that team. And, you know, they call me Big Baby. And I used to, they used to fuck with me a lot. And so I used to kind of like pout wine, you know, my first couple of weeks. And then uh, I start turning into a monster. 
after that, that's why they called me Big Baby. What well, wasn't the coach? I guess when you were getting bullied by some of the older kids, the coach would be like, "Stop crying, you big baby." Yeah, <laughs> Coach Earl, <laughs> man, stop crying, man, you big baby, man. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> you know. And then like I played two seasons with them, and Earl was just, you know, he was like my motivation, you know. And uh, you know, then I start being good. And everybody's like, yo, that's Big Baby. <laughs> oh, shit. You see them? He knocking head. He doing this. He So the name kind of like stuck to me. Well, you started playing football at nine years old. Mm -hmm. But then at 10, that's when your mom got locked up? Yeah, I was playing football up in Maryland. Then my mom got locked up, you know, for some, you know, street stuff. And she... uh my grandmother came, got us, and came back to Baton Rouge. Well, but didn't you and your sisters get put in foster care? Yeah, for a little bit. But, you know, my mom and them wasn't playing that shit. Okay. Yeah, we got through in there for a little bit, but my mom A little bit is what, uh, a couple months? Yeah, like, when well, you know, when she go to jail, you know, right. now nobody's- Child Protective walk. Services comes, yeah, takes come, the kids. come grab us. And right. then now, got to wait for my grandma to come get us. She's from Louisiana, and- we got to figure that out. So we wasn't there too long. We was just we was there for a little little stunt. Okay. So then your grandmother got you, and then the grandmother is taking care of you and your sisters? Yeah. Okay. And how long was your mom locked up for? She was for like two, three years. Okay. Was that tough being away from your only parent at that point for that long? Yeah, because my mom, like I said, she had an energy about her. Like, if she's gone, you're going to know she's gone. Like... You know she's not there, like so. It affect it affected me for sure, for sure. Well, here you are, sort of living in this somewhat chaotic kind of you know family structure. You know, it's not a traditional family by any stretch of the imagination. But then uh, you ended up moving in with a Colas Temple. Yeah, did I pronounce that right? Yeah, Colas. Colas. Uh, yeah, Colas Temple. Uh, he was a mentor of mine. Um, He's uh, also the son of Garrett Temple, who's in the NBA. Right. He was, uh, they're like family to me. Um, right. Living with them for a long time. Well, and Collis was actually the first black player to play at LSU. Yeah. In 1971. Yeah. It was just, at that point, what, no black players were allowed to play on the team at all? Yeah, yeah. He was. Sheesh. And this was 71? I mean. Yeah. You would think by that time, civil uh, rights would have taken care of that, but nah. Yeah, so. They were selling some racist shit over there. Mm-hmm. And he was the first one. Do you know what he went through, being the only black player on that field? Oh, yeah. I know what he went through. He went through a lot of sacrifice. I bet. A shitload of sacrifice. But, you know, I think it was for the great cause, though. Yeah. And Collis went on to play for the Spurs. Yeah. For, for one season. He had a little stunt. He played. Yep. Uh-huh. And you were so close to his son, Garrett Temple, that you basically just started living with him? Yeah. Um, you know, my situation, you know, was crazy. At the time, my mom was, you know, on drugs and stuff like that. So, you know, my mom was like, you know, no matter my mom being on drugs, she always was there. Like, nah, you ain't taking my son. I know what my son, you know what I mean? I know what he's worth. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. She ain't no... So every time something like that, she'll sharpen up, get right, and, and talk us stuff. You know what I mean? So um, I ended up living with them because my mom thought it was the best situation for me. And I also chose that decision, right? I could have went to, I was one of the best eighth graders in state country at that time. And mm -hmm. I could have went to any school, but um, I chose a, a more challenging school like university laboratory school. And that's where Collis was, you know, his son was involved with in, in AAU basketball too. That's where, I, that's where I met him at. Okay. And were you living with him for like four years all through high school? Yeah. Okay. Um, when I definitely, my eighth grade year to all the way my, you know, 12th grade year, 11th grade year, really, I was uh, living with him. I mean, when you look back, if you take him out of the equation, and if you were just on your own, do you think you would have made it to college and eventually went no. pro? No. You would have gotten caught up in the yeah. streets and whatever yeah. else. I was, I'd have, been, I'd have been in the streets. I mean, before you actually moved in with Collis, were you getting, you know, mixed up with, with some bullshit, getting arrested or anything else like that? Or were you pretty much a good kid focusing on sports? I was always a good kid, but, you know, 
I was outside. Yeah. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, you know, I was just, hey, you know, I was outside. Any bad situations? Yeah. What was, the, what was the worst situation you've been through personally? Personally? Yeah. During that time in your life? <sighs> Man, all types of shit. You know, back then when we grew up, it was like popular to go to the parties and stuff like that. And when you go to the parties, you know, I'm from I'm from Gus Young Parktown. It's like, you know, tough neighborhood. Like we known, like, you know, from South Baton Rouge, everybody know us where we from. And so it was hard being an athlete, but also coming, you know, going to the private school, but coming from that area. So sometimes there'll be situations where I have to go to a party, but I see my childhood friends. I'm with my private school friends, and now I see my childhood friends who've been holding me down since forever, and they about to get in a fight. You know what I mean? So now I have to make the choice. You know what I mean? Like, what? And so, you know, usually I'm gonna make the choice, the right choice, you know? of just myself at that time and just what I believe in. So yeah, there's situations where they like, yo baby, you in here, we about to tear it down, come on. I'm like, oh shit, I gotta fight. <laughs> see you guys later. Uh, hey, uh, Garrett, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Like shit like that, like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, yo guys get up out of here, I'll stay. And so now I gotta hold it down for my section. So there was moments like that, you know, and after that, you know, gunplay, you know, motherfuckers shooting outside. They ain't trying to fight. They got beat up. Now they go into their cars. So, you know, it was it was close situations where, you know, thank God that I had sports to kind of like, all right, bro, like, you know, that's not, you know, you over here with these guys, you know, and sports took me away. But when I was around, you know, I had to adapt. Mm-hmm. Well, you get to high school and you go to a private school. Uh-huh. And you start out with football initially. Yeah. So were you thinking about basketball your freshman year? Yeah. I always loved basketball. Okay. I always loved basketball. Okay. But what were you most focused on when you first got to high school? I was focused on both when I got to high school. Got it. I was really focused on both. I... I had a very big, huge love for basketball. Um, football was something that I just did really, really good. I was so good. But I think I lost the love for it because of the position I was playing in high school. Mm. Right, because you were 275 pounds uh-huh. like your freshman year. Yeah. So you were just a monster at that school. Yeah, I was, you were I was just destroying was everybody. Yeah, big motherfucker. Biggest, biggest kid on the. Really on the field, probably ever, you in know, the, playing yeah, ever, yeah, yeah, in the school ever, in the school ever, <laughs> yeah. Right. Also, you you were running a, you were running the forty and four point nine. Yeah, so I was, you were fast. Yeah, I was, a bit, and that was in high school. Yeah, exactly. I was in high school. Okay, and then you know, college recruiters were kind of like interested in you at oh, that time. Hell yeah. So, but then in the summer of two thousand one, you went to basketball camp at LSU. Yeah. Uh, Nick Saban was there. Yeah. And Shaq was there. Yeah, Shaq was around, yeah. Was that when things started to shift for you? Like, okay, maybe I should focus on basketball? (sighs) Things started to shift for me. I started getting a lot of notoriety, you know. um, Start getting a lot of people like, damn, he really, really good. You know what I mean? And, um... Things start shifting with me when I start seeing, like, people, for example, making money from playing the sport of basketball. You know what I mean? Um, I seen, you know, for example, Brandon Bass. You know, he was a guy that came up from Baton Rouge, All-American, all played in the NBA. And uh, in high school, he was the man. And I seen like, wow, this can help me get out of my situation. I knew football could, but I didn't love football like I love basketball. You know? Um, and so when the decision was to to make the 
when the decision to stop playing football came, um, it was because I was, I went to this, a summer camp at AAU and uh, it was a ranking. I was like ranked 35, 40, like 15. And then that next year I ranked like top 10. And so I was like, shit, I'm about to play basketball, hmm. you know? And, and then I hate wearing a helmet. You know what I mean? I just feel like, <laughs> you, you know, you can't see me. You right. know what I mean? Um, also a lot more damaging. And a lot of CTE, more damage. Oh, my God. Yeah. Football careers don't last like basketball careers yeah. do. And once, once you know, football players retire, they go through a lot more health problems than basketball players. A lot. So, a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, while you were uh, at LSU, you got to hang out with Shaq a little bit. Yeah. And I guess you guys were having dinner at one point. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And Shaq asked you to come outside. Mm -hmm. And what happened next? So, I was infatuated with Shaq at the time, you know, because I felt like I was a, a Shaq minion, you know. <laughs> uh, but I ended up knowing him because, you know, I was an athlete at LSU and playing at U High. And um, I got a chance to meet the director uh, over there at, with the scholarships with, you know, Mike Mullet, uh, one of his advisors, and uh, went to dinner with him at his house eating spaghetti. And Shaq goes out of nowhere. I was like, let's go outside. I'm like, all right. You got to do it in the Shaq voice. Let's go outside. <laughs> Cross side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, he's like, let's go outside. And he, we, he's like, all right, let's get down. Like, you know? And he was like, all right. You know how you wrestle, you get in the position? So mm -hmm. I'm in the position. And I'm like grabbing him, holding him, and like, Next thing you know, I slam him down like a wrestler, like, and uh, he was like, "God damn, you know, you big ass kid." And so that's how me and his relationship really started. So you slam Shaq, yeah, seven foot one, three hundred twenty-five pounds, big motherfucker. Yeah, back in the day, me and Shaq worked on a mixtape together during my DJ days. That's when he actually dissed Kobe <laughs> on the mixtape, and uh, I mean, we were on the phone a lot. And then we got to meet later on, uh -huh. I think in L.A. And I remember standing next to him going like, this is the biggest human being I've ever seen in my entire life. I've just never seen anyone this, you know, he looked, looked like a like a giant. Yeah. I, I'd never met anyone. Cause usually seven footers are usually really skinny. Yeah. Not, not him. No, no. He's, he's, he's just a massive human being. Big motherfucker. And you slam, body slammed him. Yeah. Okay. Slammed on the ground, pent him, kept him there. And Mallet was like, hey, get up off him. I want you to hurt him. <laughs> I'm like, all right. Okay. So then 2004, you went to LSU. Yeah. Majored in theater. <laughs> Were you doing like plays and stuff like that? Yeah. Well, I was doing all like like the operations, right? You start learning about the stage. You start learning about the history and stuff like that. So when it started to get to labs, and you have to really put time in. It was like time for me to go to the NBA. <laughs> so I was like, I, I got to go. I was trying this, you know, another time. But I got the basics, you know, and I left my junior year. So. Right. Not. And during the time at LSU, like Boosie was just starting to get hot and really get buzzing. Uh -huh. And you were actually bumping Boosie a lot during that time. I was I was raised on Boosie. Mm. Like Boosie badass. Zoom right by you. 765, through the green, all the time. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you wanna talk shit, you wanna run your mouth. We got some cases I jump. Like, Boosie is everything to me. <laughs> you know, when uh, when Boosie did our interview and he talked about how he had to move out of Baton Rouge because people became hypnotized with hatred. Uh -huh. Can you relate being from Baton Rouge, that type of mentality that he's talking about? Hell yeah. Motherfuckers hate you over there, man. So even in college, being a, a college uh, basketball star where you were getting hated on? Oh, most definitely. You know what I mean? You get hated on. But, uh, you know, so many different people. Hate is everywhere. You know what I mean? Um, but, like, motherfuckers will hate on you in a second, especially, like, a guy like Boosie. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, Well, you had a strong career at LSU. Uh, you actually took the took the Tigers to the first Final Four appearance since 86. Uh-huh. You lost, unfortunately, uh, yeah. to UCLA. Um, and then, like you mentioned, uh, you had a – you had a press conference, I guess, your junior year? Yeah. Junior year, where you announced that you are going to be joining the NBA draft. Mm -hmm. 
Was there a reason why he didn't spend one more year and graduate? Yeah. Because of my coach, John Brady. Hmm. He treated me like shit my last junior year. He told me to leave. I wanted to come back. Really? My senior year. Huh. Because I felt like the new coming class that was coming in that next following year, it would have gave me more weapons because I used to have tires, tires Thomas. He was a weapon for me. I didn't have no weapons, so I, I wanted to come back because I really wanted to win a national championship. You know, and so um, he told me to leave. That's crazy. Yeah. How do you tell an NBA prospect to, <laughs> to leave I wanted to stay. He told me to leave. Did that hurt your feelings? Hell yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Okay. So then you joined the NBA draft. Uh-huh. 35th overall pick, Seattle Supersonics. Mm-hmm which lasted all of 30 seconds, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> 30 seconds. I mean, when they announced you joined the, Su- the Supersonics, the Supersonics at that time, you know, Gary Payton had left a few years before. Yeah. They were still a, a serious team. Were you excited about joining the Supersonics or, or not really? I was. I was excited because I remember I worked out for them and I uh, had a great workout. And... um I um and I love Seattle. It was it was dope, yeah. you know. Uh the atmosphere, everything was super, super dope when I went out there and worked out. You know, Ray Allen, you know, Rashard Lewis. I thought about those guys being on that team and I thought about the guys like me that played on that team. Mm-hmm. They had some big, big heavy set guys and I and I felt like, okay, I understand why they drafted me. Well, before you actually got to play, you got traded. Yeah. It was I guess they traded you for Delonte West, Wally Skizerbaik, then also uh, Jeff Green. It was this weird, like, four-way trade kind of yeah, situation. and some teams, some guys went to Minnesota. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was cool. Right. So now you end up joining uh, the Celtics. Uh-huh. So Delonte West went and joined the Supersonics. Yeah, well, De- yeah, Delonte West went to the Supersonics. Yeah. yeah, in that trade. Did you know Delonte at all during your career? Yeah, it's my boy. Okay. When you see him now, how do you feel? Uh, I, would, I, I always seen demons in him. Really? Yeah. He was always, I always like, seen demons in huh, him. He was always like that. He was always somebody that was, you know, you could tell had demons, came from a struggle, fighting every day. Like I could, you know, I could tell. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, we were actually supposed to interview him uh, a few weeks ago. And we had, you know, there was a guy that was helping him out. And uh-huh. we had actually worked out like an appearance fee that was going to allow him to maybe get an apartment and, uh, you know, yeah, get, get off the bread. streets. And then the day before our interview, that's when that video circulated of him panhandling. Right. And then I guess after that video became viral, he ended up getting beat up really badly. Mm-hmm. And then they had to cancel the interview, and then we kind of just sort of backed away at that point, where, you know, because it seemed like he's just still just in very, very bad shape right now. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't feel at that point that you know him being on camera is probably the best idea. I thought that he was a little bit more together, but it seems like he's just really in bad shape. A lot of mental illness, homeless. Yeah, he fight he from the streets. Drug addict, drug yeah, addiction. He from the um, he, yeah, you know what I mean. He what I see in my neighborhood yeah. every day. Yeah. So it's just. You know, well, except people you see in your neighborhood didn't play for the NBA. <laughs> Played yeah, with LeBron, but, and you know what I'm but saying? They're, they're doctors. They're lawyers. Mm, yeah. You know what I mean? They're, 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 they're accomplished people. You know what I mean? It's the same person. It, you know, it don't matter if he played basketball or not. You know what I mean? Okay. So you joined the Celtics, and before you joined, the previous year was, was horrible for the Celtics. Yeah, they they went 24 and 58. They were trash. Just trash. Doo-doo. <laughs> uh, Doc Rivers was the new coach around that time when mm-hmm. you joined. So your rookie contract with the Celtics, was it good? It was solid. I had, a, you know. A few dollars. A few dollars. Okay. You know what I mean? It was a, you know, a second round draft, but, you know, so it wasn't. It wasn't crazy. Too but crazy, but it was, it was all right. Well, it was more than you got at that point. No, you, I mean, just, this is your first check for basketball, essentially. I mean, was LSU sort of, was there a little bit of LSU money floating around under the table? Man, I know up. how these big Southern schools are, you know, with the up. donors and the... Man, listen, 
<laughs> I was well off. Okay. I could have stayed another year. <laughs> <laughs> I could have stayed another year in college. I was right. fine. Okay. So now you're on the Celtics and uh, interesting group of people on this crew. Mm-hmm. Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, uh, Ray John Rondo, Eddie House, Kendrick Perkins. Mm-hmm. And really the, the big three are Pierce, Allen, and Garnett. Yeah. And I feel like, like this was the start of the new era of the Celtics. We were the first new big three. Yeah. Right? We started this big three stuff, the new generation. Mm-hmm. You know, the old generation had it, you know, with the Lakers and, you know, all those players they had and Celtics back in the day. But we started the new generation of teaming up, what you see today. <laughs> what was it like when you first joined the team? And, you know, you're coming from college, but now you're with the best people on the planet. Yeah. Right? From all around the world. Uh-huh. What was different once you started training with the team and playing with, with you know, your teammates? Well, first of all, I had to kind of throw whoever I was away. <laughs> uh, You're not the man anymore. Yeah, I was like, you, we don't need you, big fella. Like, we, we, we think you good. We fuck with you, but uh, you ain't the shit on, on this squad. Mm-hmm. So that was the first thing I had to endure, um, building my kind of my NBA resume mm-hmm. as far as who am I going to be, what am I going to, you know, do in this league. And um I definitely had to wait my turn because I had guys like KG, you know, Kenny Perkins, uh, PJ Brown at the time, you know, Scott Pollard, you know, Scal and Brini, James Posey, guys that all play four, five, three positions. And um, yeah, I had to, I had to sit my shit down <laughs> and kind of like figure out where do I fit in with these guys. Well, uh, while you're practicing, didn't Kevin Carnett say "fuck your swag"? <laughs> What was that? You know what I'm talking about? Man, bro. <laughs> this is no joke. Like, and this just shows the like the energy of this guy, right? Mm-hmm. It's my first day. <laughs> now, before the season start, everybody comes in and they play pickup game. Mm-hmm. Right? And so I'm the four. KG's the four. I gotta play against him. So my first day, I'm kind of excited. I'm like, God damn, it's like I'm going against KG. I got to establish myself. Like, it's almost like your first day in jail, right? <laughs> you got to, like, look around, like, all right, cool. You know what I'm saying? You got to, like, establish yourself. And so I get the ball, and I make a jump shot, right? And while I'm making a jump shot, I usually talk to myself, which KG does a lot. But, you know, I talk to myself, and I said, get up. Get it up. Right? And I made it, though. So as the ball go in, KG's looking at me. And he, like, he, like, motherfucker, you talking shit? I'm like, what? (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) In that split second, I'm like, oh, shit. Like, is either I say something, you know? And I can't, and it's in front of people, he said that, loud as hell. So I was like, Nah, man, I'm not talking shit. You know, I'm just trying to get my swag. (laughs) He turned around and said, fuck your swag. I said, I looked at him. And at that moment, I felt like I had to do something. Because when you say say shit like that, it's like, oh, you can't let you can't let nobody do that. Because everyone's watching you do this. Yeah, and I'm from the hood, too. So, you know, I'm hitting first. And next thing you know, I said, fuck your swag. In the middle of the huddle. <laughs> said, fuck your swag, just like that. And he looked at me. He's like, all right. And I was just like, God damn. <laughs> I can't believe I just, I'm about to get, I'm out of here. Welcome, <laughs> welcome to NBA. I'm out of here. I'm like, <laughs> oh, shit. So, and the next day, you know, I go home, right? And I'm thinking, like, he's not fucking thinking about yesterday. He's not bringing that back. You know what I'm saying? I have no, this is no lie. I figured I was like, well, let me get to early and see, because he gets there early. So, and he loves waffles. He makes waffles all the time. Okay. I figured I can meet him at the waffle station 
right? Because Waffle Station is like a common area. You, right. You, you don't want to fight there. Who fights over <laughs> waffles? I mean, come like, on. You're going to fight me right now. We're making waffles. Like, <laughs> you know, so, you know, I get in there, making my little breakfast. I get to the waffle. He's coming in. And he goes straight to making his breakfast in the morning because he puts his breakfast and then he goes get stretched. I meet him there. He looks right by me. Don't even say a word. I'm like, oh my god, he's letting yesterday. Pop. Like, I'm like, oh my god, he's he's not he's not letting us go. <laughs> and I swear to God, like he's mad the whole day. And I just walk up to him. And I'm like, KG, I'm sorry for yesterday. <laughs> he was like, I was like. I didn't mean nothing, no harm from that. I just felt like, you know, as a man, I had to, you know, approach you when you said, you know, fuck your swag. <laughs> and he was like, you know what? I like you, younger. You're my rook. Put me to work. I was his rookie after that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of times rookies have to go through it. I mean, uh, Gilbert Arenas is notorious for, <laughs> oh my God. you know, torturing he, people. He's horrible. You know, <laughs> that he's are rookies. Uh, what was the worst thing you had to do as a rookie? I There was never a moment I had to do anything bad. Really? He was, he would win pots in the game and he'd be like, you know, baby, you know, count this money up for me, da, 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 da. And I'd start counting it up. He was like, separate the 50s from the hundreds. And he'd be like, take them 50s, give me the hundreds. It's like $5,000 worth of 50s. Mm. And I'm like, he's like, I don't like 50s. <laughs> and he'll do, that in right front of Paul. he'll do that in front of Paul and Perk. And he'd be like, oh, I don't like 50s. And he'll let me grab a 50. So I'm like, damn, thank you, OG. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Shit like that. Like, he would take me shopping. Mm. He would take me shopping, right? And, you know, my mama, you know, tell me, when you go in the store, don't get, don't touch nothing you can't afford. Like, for real. So we be in Louis, he's shopping, Sam Cassell, you know, other, you know. And he like, I'm just sitting there. And he's like, you don't like nothing in here? It's the Louis store. It's closed down. They closed it down for us. I'm like, I don't know if I can fit nothing, man. No, nah, you know, try this shit on. I'm like, nah, no, no, try this shit on. Like, try it on, big fella. Like, yeah, you look nice. You look good. That's when I started rocking scarves mm. <laughs> and like Louis hats and shit. I was just like, damn. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and he would teach me so much, like just riding along with him, you know, how to handle things. Like, like he was, it was dope. Like, I remember one time I, I I got in an you know, argument with my girl and, you know, I had to, you know, leave the house. He was like, come stay with me. This motherfucker was like, yo, go to the store. I was like, I don't got no money. He said, go on the fishbowl on the counter. In the front, there's a fishbowl in this house of just like 10s, 20s, and 5s, and 1s, and 50s. All the bills he didn't like. Yes, <laughs> that he don't want. And it's just like sitting there. And I'm just like, well, like this, just the, the, the stash and grab, like, you know, I'm gonna need some cash, go to the store, get some backwoods, you know, whatever. I'm like, damn, big fella. <laughs> so I get in there, get my hand and. <laughs> <laughs> Is it true that he made you cry your rookie year? I am a passionate person. KG would never try to harm me or any type of way, but he'll get on my ass. And what you guys seen that day, when I was crying on a bench, is that I'm a second round player. I can get chipped off any minute. When you go in a game, when starting five plays a game, you're never supposed to let the league come back up where they have to check in. I know I didn't play a lot. So when I got out there, that happened, right? And so KG's like, yo, da, 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 da. and like, I swear to God, this man is so motivational, so like his words lift you. I felt so bad for my, I felt bad, like, damn, fuck. And I got upset on the bench. And that's what that was about. It mm. wasn't one like he was getting on me. It was more like he was helping me and I fucked up because I wanted to play bad, <laughs> you know? Uh, there was a story, I guess uh, Kendrick Perkins said it, that, uh, Ray Allen, Ray Allen Rondo ended up getting into a fight with boxing gloves on. Yeah. 
What was that about? Well, Ray was uh, Ray was possibly wanting Chris Paul in the trade, right? It was supposed to trade for Chris Paul one year. And, you know, that's after we won it. And, uh, you know, Rondo did like that. <laughs> Rondo did like that. So, you know, and then sometimes Ray on defense would suck ass and Doc wouldn't say shit. Like, he would just, Rondo, you're fucking up. Chauncey Billups is killing you. Like, Rondo's like, yo, Chauncey Billups ain't fucking scored this fucking series. It's Rip Hamilton that's fucking busting our ass. <laughs> so, like, shit like that, like, that was happening. And, you know, they got, they had beef. And so they boxed it out. <laughs> they put on gloves. They put on gloves and really, like, threw hands. You watched it. I watched it. Who I was there? It was like you could just tell Rondo was trying to knock his head off. Like, <laughs> oh, so Rondo was going on. Rondo was like, hmm, like, mm. and like, and I was like, whoa, you know, Ray was jabbing. You know what I'm saying? But, is this on video somewhere? Nah, was, nah, nah. This okay. is this is really like man, it. If you got to be there, it's in fight there. club, basically. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So Rondo was trying to like, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And this was in the locker room. It was like in like the little weight room area. A little what he stretch at and stuff. Okay. Management clearly did not know this was happening. Oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> hell no. <laughs> hell no. Did they get in trouble after? after Shit, the... no. No? It made things at ease, though. Okay. We're like, yo, I know you don't fuck with me. I don't fuck with you, but let's win. You know what I mean? What's the whole thing with uh, Paul Pierce uh, hating LeBron? I don't really hate LeBron. But he just like, I beat it. Like, you know, I, I, what you mean? Like, you know what I mean? That's Paul. Like, you know, West Coast. You know what I mean? He, uh, he, you know, he a real nigga. <laughs> you know what I mean? In a way, that's my boy. You know what I'm saying? So he, you know, he got at LeBron at a time. So he feel that way. He always going to feel that way. Well, you're playing for the team. And uh, the first time you actually uh, take the court was December 12th, uh, 2007. Kendrick Perkins got injured. Scored 16 points, nine rebounds. You guys ended up winning the game 90 to 78. How did it feel to actually get on the court and really play? That was that day. That was that day I was like, damn, I made it. I'm here. I can play. Um, we were playing Detroit and Doc threw me in. Perkins got hurt. Doc threw me in in the fourth and I think I had to score like 16, 12 points in the fourth quarter or some crazy thing like that. And it was kind of like my, hey, I'm here. I arrived. Like, right. I can play. Like, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's the first game you've won playing with the actual team. Yeah. So it's like almost like your first real win in yeah. a way. Yeah, yeah, first real win. Right. And, and that season, the Celtics had the biggest single season turnaround in NBA history. Yeah. They went 66 and 16 in the regular season. Mm -hmm. And you guys actually make it to the NBA Finals. Mm -hmm. Here you are, your rookie year, and you guys play against the Lakers. Mm -hmm. How was that series? It was great, man. It was an epic series because you got the new era of the big three. The Lakers, the Celtics, that whole tradition right there. And then our journey through the playoffs was just amazing. Like, you know what I mean? We played tough, you know, Atlanta. We played Cleveland tough. Like, it was just a great series as far as just of games. And then coming up to the Laker game for the finals was just like the mega joint. And, um, you know, at the time, I really didn't understand as I do now how important that moment was. You know what I mean? So it was it was a it was a great experience. It was a great experience. I had a, I had a great time whooping the Lakers ass and Okay. Uh, how much did you play in that series? I played a little bit. I had 6 8 points in that last game, okay. was, you know. What was it like to be on the on the court with Kobe? That was crazy. Mm. It was just crazy to watch him play. Like you know what I mean cuz he, like the motherfucker spoke Spanish, Italian, 
Like he was talking to Paul Gascon, like I da, 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 da. I'm like, oh shit, Paul, what y'all about to do? <laughs> like, damn, Paul, what did he say? He's like, I don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit. Like he was just you seen his passion for the game, you seen his worth ethic like out there. Kobe was a he was a just amazing just to watch. Right. But it wasn't enough because you guys won in game six. Yeah, we we won. 131 and 92. You guys blew him out. Yeah, we, we <laughs> that we, last game. Yeah, we did. Uh, Paul Pierce was the MVP. Uh huh. What was it like to here? You are. You just got to the NBA and you win the NBA championship, the 17th title for the Celtics. I what was I, that? Was that the biggest run? Was that the most NBA championships of a team at, at that time, point? Yeah, at the time, yeah. At the time, yeah. But um. It was great, man. Like, ah, when I think about that shit, like, you know, the the parade, you know, I had my shirt off. I was the first one to start that shit. Taking your shirt off, doing the parade, all that shit. I was I was out there. That was so much fun. It was just just winning the championship in Boston just it was a whole different experience. Like they love basketball up there. Like it was just, you know, like to this day, like I can go up there and stand on the corner and a hundred people walk up to me like, big baby, oh my God, what the fuck? Like, you know what I mean? So it was a special moment, man, to be a part of that, you know. Well, uh, the Celtics fans love basketball, but they're also known to be a, a racist city. Yeah. Like, for example, you know, Gilbert Arenas, you know, when he played against the Celtics. He was talking about how fans would call him the N-word mm -hmm. with the hard R and, you know, that type of thing. Like, I think you were playing against the Celtics and one of the fans started calling you like the N-word mm -hmm. with like a, the hard R. Yeah, or like hard E-R, yes. The hard R yeah, N-word. Yeah. I mean, they were nice to you because you were helping them win, but when you saw that type of thing happen with other teams, what'd you think? So like, dang. Meaning like the racism and stuff like yeah. that. I'm sure you heard it. Yeah, I heard racism. But Boston never showed me no racism. You know what I mean? I probably because you know, I you know, you know it's there, right? You you feel it, right? You see what Paul Revere rode from. God damn, Paul Revere wrote through here. You like, you know, there's gotta be some racist shit going on. <laughs> but it's just like they never showed it to me, yeah. you know, because I f was like one of their own. Like, you know what I mean? It's almost playing for the Celtics, you know, same thing as Bill Russell. You know, uh, you know, in Boston, I would think, you know, yeah, they, you know, might don't like Bill Russell as a, a color, but they love Bill Russell. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So I've never seen it, you know what I mean? I never had an issue with anybody talking about racism, you know what I mean? I've, I've dealt with that more in the South. In anything. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So then the next season starts, the 2009 season. And I feel like you're getting into your stride at this uh, point. You're getting more playing time. Uh, I remember you had a career high of 24 points playing against the Grizzlies. Uh, and then you guys make it to the playoffs. Uh -huh. And uh, Kevin Garnett ends up uh, getting injured. Uh -huh. So they start bringing you in more. Yeah. So so how is that whole experience now that you're getting to, you know, get on the court more? Yeah, I got to, I got to. You know, opportunity came. You know, as a basketball player, we love opportunity, you know, you know, to be able to be on the floor. Um, and I got my chance. You know, I, I had an understanding of the game. You know, I had a couple years under my belt. And I understand the flow, you know. And with more minutes, understanding your role and who you are, you know, really, really fast because you're a role player. You know, so I, I kind of, it was, it was a great opportunity for me to show, you know, everybody else that I can, you know, do more. Well, I remember in game four uh, in the conference semifinals, I guess after beating uh, the Magic, you ended up, uh, I guess, running into a 12-year-old yeah. kid. Uh-huh. And, like, knocking him down or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was against Orlando. Yeah, it became a thing, I guess. It, it was against Orlando. We're playing in a series. We're, you know, if we lose this game, we're going down. So we're either tying the series up right here. Um, it was a play for Ray and Paul, second option. I ended up getting the ball for some reason. 
because <laughs> Dwight ended up double teaming Paul because he knew Paul was going to take the last shot. So he went and double teamed Paul, leaving me wide open. And I'm wide open. I hit that motherfucker. And then after I hit it, bang, I'm like bagging out and trying to run back, you know. And there was a kid in the way. I was like, oh, just kind of pushed him. <laughs> like, yeah. like, you know, it's what he paid for. You know what I'm saying? Like, he paid for that. Like, you know, that's like kind of experience. You know, it wasn't like I, it was like a game winning shot. Like, great seats, kid. You were right in the middle of it. Like, you know what I mean? So, you know, I didn't intensely try to push the man, like push the little boy. But they did make me apologize. Wasn't that crazy? Yeah. The NBA, like, call, like, you have to apologize to the kid. Swear to God. Couldn't or what? Leave. You're going to get fined or something? Damn near. I felt like I was going to get fined. Mm. I think the dad was so mad. You know what I mean? He he must have raved because he was a season ticket holder. Mm. They made me apologize to that kid. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, damn. <laughs> okay. And then in August of that year, you signed a two-year uh, $6.5 million contract with yeah. the Celtics. I was happy about that. Yeah. Because that was the big check that finally came for you. That was that was the big check that finally came. And it was so it was the thing about that contract, it was the same contract if I was the 17th pick of the draft. And that was kind of like a big thing for me because I wanted to be first round. Mm. So when my agent told me that he was like, You're paid like the 17th player at the NBA draft because I had a two year deal. And then I got another two year deal, but the two year deal was like six, like you said. So mm-hmm. I was just like, damn, you know, that's crazy how the universe works. I ended up really getting what I truly wanted anyway, you know? I mean, now you're making 3.25 million a year. I mean, you gotta pay the taxes, you gotta pay your yeah, agent. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's chipping away at that, but still yeah. now you're at least comfortable yeah. financially. Mm-hmm. Did you splurge? Did you go crazy? Oh yeah. <laughs> what was the, the dumbest thing you bought during that time? I used to buy all type of shit. Clothes. You know, the first million I got, I just took it out of the bank and just rolled around in it. Wait, wait, you actually did that? I actually, hey. uh, Wait, so you went to the bank? Hey, Republic Bank, can I get a million dollars? All right, Mr. Davis, the million dollars to be here in four days. In hundreds? In hundreds. I would ask for for once. (laughs) <laughs> if you could go that far. Or I would get, I, no, I got like four out and then I got like another s- six out. Okay. And so that's how I went. And then, so you got a million dollars in hundreds. Yeah. How, how how much is that, like, how much space does that take? It's not that much. It's, it's not that much. Yeah, but you, when you spread it out, <laughs> when you spread it out and start throwing it out everywhere, it's kind okay. of a lot. So you, you put it in your car. You took it home, uh-huh. and what'd you do with the money? Well, I'm with one of my baddies. I'm with one of the bad baddies Okay, at the time. She's all going crazy, I'm she sure. She's like, ah, we lit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we lit. So, you know, the minute she knows she ain't getting that much, right. you know. But, um, yeah, we had wild, crazy sex. and I was On just, the money. On the money, like, smoking, you know, we we was... We was lit. I was just like, damn, I made it. Good for you, man. It was it was a great good, time. Good for you. That's what's up. Houston, Texas. Mm. I went to Houston. That, that was Houston. Okay. So then the next year, you guys make it to the finals, to, to the uh, Eastern Conference finals. Uh-huh. You guys are playing uh, the Orlando Magic. And then uh, Dwight Howard elbows you in the face. Yeah. You get a concussion. Yeah. How bad of a hit was that? It was probably the hardest I've ever been hit in the face in my life. In your life? Well, not in my life. I got beat up a couple of times by a couple of dudes, but a couple of people at one time. Yeah. Uh, but one person? No, not one person beat me up. It was like no, that's what I saying. But by one, by Dwight Howard. Oh, by one, one person. person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Dwight wow. Howard is huge. I mean, I remember uh, like his his me. shoulder span man, is like massive. The man hit me. I couldn't bounce back. Uh. It was one of them hits like. When I see him, it's like, man, I really don't. It bothered me how bad, <laughs> like you know what I mean. Like, mm. you want to get him back a little bit. I can't bit? let it go. Like I can't. You know what I mean. Like to this but, day, have you ever run into him afterwards and had a conversation about this? No, I'm gonna talk about it. 
Y'all might not be ready to scratch, but I might, t- I might talk about it like, man, you, okay. you know you fucked up for that, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, you guys end up making it to the finals again uh-huh. against the Lakers. Uh-huh. Again. But this time around, things went a little different. Yeah. Kobe was in his bag. Not really, but really. <laughs> you know what I mean? That game, he shot the ball like shit. Game seven. It was really like Ron Artest and Derek Fisher. Mm. Those are the ones who won the fucking game for them. But um, that was Doc's fault. I blame that on Doc. Really? How so? Because Doc has a mentality of rolling with his veterans, the guys that he feel like got him there. But when you go back to 2010 game four, right, that was my big breakout game meaning like the Shrek and Donkey, Nate Robinson, you know, that game we had to find energy for something else. It's the same thing for game seven, Doc. We got to find the energy from somewhere else in game seven. So Rasheed Wallace playing all these minutes, KG playing all these minutes, you got to let us give them some break. And there was a period in that second half, he didn't sub. And so now, you know what I mean? Now it's like, you know, and I get it. You want your veterans to help you. You rely on your veterans. You rely on the guys that got you there. But as a coach, you have to adjust. And that's the greatest thing about being coaches, being able to adjust on the fly at this moment. What is going to get us there? What button can I go out there? Because at the same time, I've already proven myself in game four that I can get things done. I can go out there and get us some quality buckets, quality shots, you know? And so I feel like he didn't use, you know, what truly got him there. He went to, oh, KG, Rasheed Wallace, everybody. And then, you know, guys like Shaq, he was on that team. He didn't play. You know what I mean? I don't know if he had a foot injury. Yeah, we got to talk about that, Shaq. I don't, we got to talk about that. <laughs> Shaq, God damn it, y'all, you was on that team. I don't care. No damn foot. Like, he had a toe injury. Come on, Shaq, you can still play. I think we was playing the Lakers and somebody told Shaq not to play, man. I got a problem with Shaq with that, man. Shaq was on that 2010 team. Right. Perkins get hurt. Where, where are you, Shaq? You got a toe injury. Perkins, Perkins had an ACL injury. Hmm. Shaq post been a Shaq. I got to see you about something, Shaq. Me and you, Shaq. I got to talk to you about that. Well, Lakers end up winning. I know. Uh, Kobe got the MVP. Yeah. <laughs> were, you, were you heartbroken at that point? Fucking uh, heartbroken. <laughs> I was crying my ass off. Oh, you actually cried? <laughs> I cried like a baby in the back. In <laughs> 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 that motherfucker, boo horn. Mm. <sighs> okay, well, well, that happens. And then in 2011, you end up getting traded yeah. to Orlando. Yeah. So now you actually get to play with Dwight Howard. I know. <laughs> After he elbowed you in the After face. After knocked me out, right? <laughs> yeah. Did you actually, like, when you guys started playing together, d- did that conversation ever come up? Yeah. And what did he say? He's like, I didn't mean to, man. You know, your elbow, you know, my elbow just came down. Your face was right there. You know. Okay. And uh, J.J. Reddick's on the team. Jason uh-huh. Richardson, Larry Hughes, uh, Jameer Nelson. Yeah. Um, But... When you get there, it wasn't really a good fit. Hell no, it wasn't a good fit. It was a good fit. And, it's, you know, knowing Dwight for a long time and stuff like that, because we was in the same class. But um, the coaching, Stan Van Gundy, he was, he was different. <laughs> Big baby! Ah! Like the way he screamed, like. I remember he kicked me out of practice one time. So I was like, Coach, why are we doing this defensively? This doesn't work. He was like, this is not the Celtics. Get out of my pocket. Get out of my... I'm like, oh, my God. Put a big asshole in the door. Oh, you punched the, the door? I fucking pushed the door in the wall and it stuck. <laughs> <laughs> they had to take the door off the hinges because the door was stuck in the wall. Yeah, that team... Yeah. Okay. Uh, but then that next year, it seemed like you did a little better. 
You had a career high of 31 points uh, when you guys played against the, uh, the Pistons. Yeah, I was, you know, Dwight just left. And you know when a big-time player leaves and they get traded, everybody goes. So I was the only one that kind of really stayed. And that was kind of like my big opportunity to start, like, being a starter in the league. Yeah. And um, it, was a, it was a good little short period. <laughs> so, I, you know, that I broke my foot. <laughs> well, that same year, 2013, there was a, a video that circulated of you at a, a motel in Florida. Uh, a travel lodge. Travel lodge. Yeah. Uh, and at one point, you reach over the desk and grab the, the computer keyboard <laughs> and just, like, pull it out of the, the socket. Uh, what what exactly happened? Oh, man. What are you doing at Travel Lodge anyway? So let, let's just start there. At, at, the, at the One Star ah, Motel. Ah, the, ah, the multi-millionaire ah, staying at the Travel Lodge. Ah, Is that where the side chick was, was meeting you there? There's got to be a story about the Travel Lodge. <laughs> it's crazy, blah. You about to get the real. It's let's, crazy. Let's hear, let's hear it. So that year was a tough year for me, mm -hmm. right? I was coming back for an injury, and you know, when Orlando, they don't know what the fuck they're doing in their, their 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 organization, right? They they don't know what they're picking, they don't know what they're doing. So I was frustrated because they were trying to figure out who their young core was, but I was sitting here trying to still save my career, and so I was ready to play, and they went to Boston, and I wanted to play at Boston. They didn't let me go for some type of reason, so I stayed home. Um, and I went out that night, mm -hmm. you know, um, I went out to uh, Cleo's strip club and, um, at the Cleo strip club, you know, at the time I had just, I was building a house. And so I didn't want to go to my house. I hadn't, I didn't have no furniture in it yet. Cause I was building in construction and, uh, my apartment, I was like, I don't want to bring her to my apartment. Well, you took a stripper home? Yeah. Okay, got it. Little stripper, took the stripper home. Got it. So I'm drunk. I don't even really drink. This is why I don't drink today, because of these situations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm drunk. And so, boom, I'm I'm ready to go in. I'm ready to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm ready. I'm like, I got to find somewhere to bust her up right quick. <laughs> so, boom, she driving. It wasn't the girl in the video. That was some girl just in the lobby. She was a scared little white girl in the lobby. But my thing was in the in the truck. So I go in there and looking for the room. <laughs> I'm like, damn. Like, y'all got any rooms in here? He was like, no. I was like, what? Y'all got no rooms in here? He was like, oh, let me see. So he go, he's in the back. He's like, Ah, we just sold this room. Da, 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 da. I'm like, I'm here first. And so I'm drunk. I I wanna I wanna smash bad. I think that was just it. I wanted to hit something bad. Like I <laughs> and he had an attitude and he was cussing back and forth. We got started getting back and forth with each other. And then I just was like, you know what? Give me this motherfucker. Ah! And just do it. And I just left. And you know, I end up going in, you know, to my house with no furniture, smashing on a beanbag. Okay. Were the police called or anything else like that? I mean, because nah, the footage nah, started to circulate. Police, police, police didn't call. They called when I got to the gym. They was like, what happened? <laughs> I was like, what you mean? I'm like, what you mean happened? I'm acting like, what you mean? It was like the video of you and the travel lodge destroyed the travel lodge. And I was like, I was shitting on myself. Damn near I farted for show. <laughs> I'm past gay, like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> TMZ, no. <laughs> That's how that happened, mm. man. Uh, yeah, man, that was, that was the start of, the, that was some crazy shit. So then that next year, uh, you and the Orlando Magic mutually agree. To part ways. Yeah, they got rid of me, basically. Yeah. You need a contract buyout. <laughs> yeah. And now you're a free agent. Uh-huh. A lot of teams were actually interested. Yeah, they at were. At the time. They were. But you ended up going with the Clippers. Yeah. Worst mistake I ever made. Well, because Doc Rivers was there, and he had coached you uh, 
with the Celtics. Celtics. So you felt more, I guess, most I comfortable over comfortable, there? I felt comfortable like he knew who I was, mm-hmm. you know, but he did. He knew a, a part of me, right? Orlando made me a different person, right? Because I got money now. And the NBA, when you make money and you get paid you money, you're like you're considered something, mm-hmm. you know? And so I was different. So when I was there, you know, I done made some money. I didn't got to be able to lead a team in a small way, you know what I mean? Help. Um, go through some ups and downs with Orlando Magic, but come back to a veteran team and help. But I came back as like, you know, the new Glenn Davis. He saved me as an old Glenn Davis. And it just didn't work with the Clippers. He he didn't fuck with me. <laughs> well, you guys actually got into it uh, when you played the Rockets. You know what? In the locker room, right? No, this is the craziest thing. And this is why, this is the type of shit Doc be doing. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so first of all, me and Doc have a better relationship than any other of these people on this basketball court, on this team, right? You know, I'm, I came with him from the, you know, so we should be able to talk with each other. I'm in the game against Houston and I'm not playing a lot. You know, he's not playing me a lot. He's taking me out the game real fast. I'm like, Doc, what you brought me here for? And I was sitting there, I said it to him going down to the bench. This motherfucker kicked me out the game. Right. Security actually showed up and escorted you. And escorted me out the game. Yeah. And so, like, that shit right there kills my career. Mm. When you think about it, Doc, you drafted me. I won a championship with you. Why would you, just because I said, are you, you know, what did you bring me here for, Doc? Let me hoop. You kick me out the game? And that's the type of shit he did. That's why I can't really fuck with him like that in a way. Like, I fuck with him, but that type of shit right there is not, it doesn't help empower, especially, you know, a kid that has never left you at the altar. Every time you called his number with the Celtics, he was there for you. So there's no need for you to kick me out the game because I'm having a a, a man, like a talk with you. Anybody on this floor right now does can have that talk with you because I was there with you. I've earned my stripes to be able to have a conversation with you and not you kick me out the game. And that shit killed my career. Hmm. Because guess what? Other teams that need role players and veterans, what you think they thinking? I mean, you never really hear that to the point where an actual player on a team gets escorted out of the, the arena bench. with security. That's crazy. And that actually happened on camera, right? It was the most, it was the most embarrassing thing in my one of my part of my careers. Yeah. It was one of those things when you're trying to build, you're back on and you're trying to build, and those things happen. It's like, oh fuck. Oh, nope. Oh. And why, Doc, you know me. Why would you do that? Like, why would you kick me off the, the bench? It's one thing not letting me play no more. Sit your ass at the end of the bench. But get off the bench? I just don't. That's why, you know, me and him, I, I, that shit right there. Because, you know, players like me need those little moments. I'm not a starter. But my character, little things, those are things that stand out. Those are why guys like Garrett Temple, my best friend, is playing for many years. Because of his character, what people expect from him off the court, on the court, and that little thing right there after all I've, you know, that kind of pushed me on out. Like, oh, you know. Right, but you're still on the team. Even after you get kicked out, you know, you, you come back to practice yeah. afterwards. Did you guys ever have a conversation about that? It was always Doc Way. Mm-hmm. It was always Doc Way. You know, um, it was it was it was his way, and you know his way was for the betterment of the team, right? Because he's the president, he's the coach, he's damn near everything at this moment. Mm-hmm. So every decision he made was like f- for the team. So I had to like, you know, all right, Doc, it's for the team. You know what I mean? And not like tell him like, hey, Doc, listen, man, this is this is what it is. This is this is how I am. You know what I mean? Like. He didn't fuck with me like that in a way. You know what I mean? Well, uh, when did the Donald Sterling thing happen? Yeah, I was on the team during that time. During that time, right? Yeah. Did you have any interaction with Sterling at that point? A little bit. 
I had a little interaction with him. Was there any sort of... I never felt anything, but, well, his energy, you know, when a motherfucker walking around and, you know, you kind of feel the energy. I'm an energy guy. Like, you mm-hmm. could just tell he had it in him. You know what I mean? Um, but I was there from that situation. I was there. I was in the midst of it during the playoffs. You know, I turned my shirt inside out, stand up. Mm. I did all that. You know what I mean? So when you heard the recorded phone call, what'd you think? I was just like, Hey, this is a motherfucker. This is what, I, you know, this what this country built off of. Mm. Like it is what it is. Like it's still around. Like I, you know, you know, at the time I didn't trip about it. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I mean, he lost the team over that. Yeah, he did. Yep. I didn't trip about it. Like, I just knew he was a scumbag, you know, that type of shit he do. You know, but he mad because another motherfucker hitting this girl, you know, and it's just these big black African basketball players busting my wife up, the little girl he was mad at, and that's what happens, you know. You know, motherfuckers get mad. Well, you end up signing, uh, even after all that, all the drama, you end up, Resigning for a one-year deal with the Clippers, right? But then in 2015, uh, you end up having a an accident with your ankle, right? You had surgery, yeah, which meant that you couldn't play for like 12 weeks. Yeah, that basically was my career, you know, with Doc that situation, and then. You know, I had a couple other situations with the Amsterdam. They put me on TV, you know, TMZ because I was over there smoking a the blunt at a, at a fucking, you know, in Amsterdam. It's legal. Yeah. So I'm with Matt. You know, I had that situation. So Doc took that, even you know, and okay, let me give you a this one year deal minimum when I'm way better than that. Mm-hmm. And so I had to go back to that because Doc was the only person that took me back because I was with his players. I had a deal with Washington Wizards at the time before I was going to sign back with the Clippers and they shut it down. And Doc was like, you know, what you want to do? You know what I mean? And he lowballed me, you know, because of that situation. It was like, yo, you over here smoking weed. I'm like, I'm with DeAndre Jordan. I'm with Matt Barnes. I'm with, we all hanging. We all on vacation over here. You know what I mean? Why, why would you, you my boy. Why would you lowball me? I'm like your son. Didn't you pay your son? Right? You know what I mean? Like, Look out for me. That motherfucker did. He went pay Spencer Halls. That's my boy, Spencer Halls. He went pay Spencer Halls $22 million. Mm. And, you know, that ended up happening. So I didn't play that much that year because Spencer came. Then the playoffs comes and what he does. Go to what he knows. Spencer don't play none of the playoffs, but I end up breaking my ankle. And so the fucked up thing about that is that when I broke my ankle, they never told me my ankle was broke, right? Mm-hmm. The Clippers never did. When I broke my ankle that playoffs, right, I was playing, playing, and Doc pulls me to the side. It's like, you look like you're out of shape. I said, no, I, I broke my ankle. This is the Houston series. I said, I think my ankle's broke. And he was like, is it broke or not? I'm like, you know, let's go get an x-ray. I go get an x-ray. They're like, oh, no, it's not broke. And I'm like, all right, they shot me up like three times. Like, boom, boom, boom. I got so many shots, I couldn't get no more shots anymore. You can only get like three, they say. And so um, I go the whole summer not knowing that my ankle is broke because the doctors over there, the Clippers, didn't do the right things to when I leave my exit meeting to say, hey, are you healthy? No, you know, they didn't do that. So I go my whole last year in the summer thinking, oh, I just got to do rehab, you know, but I go to uh, get ready to go to Sacramento and I'm like, something's wrong with my foot. I go back to my doctor up up uh, in North Carolina, foot doctor, and he looks and he's like, your foot, your ankle's broke. Mm. And so then now it's September and now with me being an older player, with me, you know what I mean? You know, then I'm out and then everybody's like, it's on to the next. And so now my foot's broke, I gotta get surgery. And now I'm out the whole season. 
Right. With a broken foot. Now season's ready. I got to get, start playing again. I just got out of cast. I got to do rehab. So that summer, I get ready to go to the Spurs. That's my last chance. I don't go. Because I haven't played my foot. I don't even know if I can run. You know what I mean? So I end up falling out of like the, the shuffle of NBA basketball players. And then also that stigma that other things put on me ended up killing my career. Yeah. And that was essentially the end yeah. uh, of your NBA career mm-hmm. at that point. Uh, in 2017, a, a video circulated of a, of a fist fight. Oh, you that, the guy. that wasn't me. That's that some you? dude in some hood. Oh, that's not you? That's not me. Okay. I got them bitches. Like, <laughs> okay. My shit retarded. Like, <laughs> that's not you. Okay. My shit retarded. Like, he, like, that's not me. Everybody's like, oh, that's you fighting, big baby, some little dude. No, that's not me. Okay. I mean, little dude got a few few in there. Yeah, you know, it's pretty good. Days, pretty good like, I'm like, oh, that ain't me. Okay. That is not me. Looks man. like you a little bit. It's not me. It's not man. you. Okay, got Thank you for no, clearing that up. Me. Okay, but then that next year in 2018, you get arrested for drug possession and drug distribution. Uh huh. So, once again, you're in a motel. Yeah. <laughs> you and motels just don't don't really. Don't <laughs> was, it, was it like a Hampton Inn or something like that? Well, you know, I have a label, right? And so I was trying to go sign an artist in uh, Maryland. Okay. And I used to live in Maryland because you know I used to live there before my mom. You know, my mom went to jail up there. So, um, you know, I was there trying to you know, sign a sign my artist. And at the same time, I had just gotten a cannabis business and I brought all my work with me, like notebooks and stuff like that. And then I bought some extra weed, you know, like four, four zips. So I'm coming back in the hotel, boom, boom, boom. The manager looking like, he looking at us, I'm like, damn, you know, we smelling like weed, but I got a briefcase. Cause I had just hit, I, I had just hit on the dice for like 60 bands. And then I had had another like 40 on me just because, you know, I'm hanging with the rappers, I'm, you know, big baby. So I get a knock on my door, boom, 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 boom. They're like, did you ask for towels? I was like, no. I open the door, they're like, you're doing drugs in here. I'm like, no, sir, I'm just rolling up a blunt. I'm about to leave. We leave, so. We leave, literally, I left my phone. I was like, damn, I left my other phone. Go back. I go back to the hotel. The police are knocking, coming out of my room. I'm like, why are y'all in my room? There was like, there's illegal drugs activity going on. I was like, what? Like, what are you talking about? So boom, they was like, well, we want to search the room. I was like, well, you can't search my room. You got to get a judge. So I sit there for hours, sit there for hours. They search my room. They see my ledge that I got from my cannabis company. I have groves and stuff like that, legal groves. So they find $92,000 in cash, 126 uh, grams of marijuana. Mm-hmm. And you get charged. They charge me. Uh, but ultimately, you agree to pay a maximum fine of $15,000. Mm-hmm. And they essentially, they move the case to a stat docket, which basically means that they won't charge you indefinitely. They basically suspend the case indefinitely. So yeah. there's a case, but there's not really a case. Not a case. So basically you paid $15,000 to get out of it. Yeah. And then after that happens, you post a video of yourself on a private plane with a bunch of money eating chicken. <laughs> Just a stunt, a stunt on everybody, I guess. That was the stupidest thing I ever did. <laughs> That's one of the stupidest things. That's, that's a big baby moment where I don't know what the fuck to do. <laughs> it just came out on ESPN. I don't know what to do. <laughs> fuck it. Let me go ahead and put this by. <laughs> and that's what I did. I wasn't thinking at the time, but I was just so f- mad that I got arrested for some weed. Right. And now now I'm trying to go back to the NBA at the time, trying to figure it After out. After get arrested for drug dealing, <laughs> quote unquote, yeah. And so now that was like close the door to the NBA chapter there. Right. So, um, 
Yeah, I was eating Popeyes. That was my f- choice of food at the time. <laughs> okay. I was like, my, I told my boy, I was like, yo, we were just riding, we were riding back, and I was just riding back to LA from New York. And I was like, make this video, bro. <laughs> I need to say something. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I said that it it went it went crazy. Everybody. Yeah. It went crazy. Like my hood, my hood, my hood. My hood cred went to a whole nother level. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> My hood cred went to a whole nother level. Was that the same year that you joined the Big Three? I think that was the following year. Following year, right. Yeah. And you guys actually won. Yeah, we won a championship. How did that feel? That was cool. It's cool. Big Three, cool. Yeah. 303. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It was with old NBA players. That was the fun part. Like, mm-hmm. Quinn Rich sees. He's one of my best friends. Like, He's one of my guys, so that's why I, that's why I played. You know what I mean? Like to be around the guys and stuff like that. It was fun. I mean, did you deal with Ice Cube a lot during that time, or? No, nah, Ice Cube ain't really fuck with me like that. Nah. Yeah, but you know he fuck with me. But you know, I feel like I should be Debo on Friday. He's he's not. <laughs> he's not fucking with that. I, I'm like, bro, are you serious, bro? Like, are oh, you actually brought that up to him? Hell yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, he like fuck that. Oh, he actually said fuck that? <laughs> He's not fucking with <laughs> Okay, well, the next year, 2021, um, uh, your hometown actually donated a basketball, well, uh, basically built a, a basketball court in your honor at the Boys and Girls Club in uh, Metro Louisiana. Yeah, that was fun. In, in Baton Rouge. Uh, how did that feel, to have your hometown build that, a court in your honor like that? That's, it just shows, like, all the work I put in, you know what I mean? Uh, shout out to Nancy Lieberman. She was uh, my big three coach. Um, she hooked that up, you know, to, you know, they wanted that, that to be done. So, you know, it was, it was just a good, uh, good situation for me, you know, um, to have my name on the court and donate it, you know, in my name. So it's pretty cool. Well, but then October 7th of 2021, uh-huh. that's when all hell broke loose. Yeah. You, along with 18 other former NBA players, were indicted in a federal grand jury uh-huh. on charges of conspiracy to commit health care fraud and wire fraud for allegedly defrauding the NBA's health and welfare benefit plan out of nearly $4 million. Uh-huh. I'm just going to read what the allegations are. Yeah. So, they're saying that uh, you were part of a group of people that filed fraudulent insurance claim, claims for reimbursement. Uh, from 2017 to 2020, according to the indictment, players submitted phony invoices to the NBA's health plan for reimbursements for services that were never actually received from a chiropractor's office, two dental offices, a wellness office that specialized in sexual health, anti-aging, and general well-being. Terrence Williams, the, ski, uh, Terrence Williams, the scheme's alleged ringleader, uh, who played four years at the NBA, circulated false invoices to others in exchange for kickbacks. Mm -hmm. Uh, Among the players that uh, Williams recruited, uh, there was Tal Fair, who played for the Blazers, uh, Minnesota Timberwolves and six other teams uh, Mm -hmm. from 2004 to 2013, Davis, uh, as well as a bunch of other players. Mm -hmm. Um, Working with two unnamed co-conspirators, Williams created fake invoice and fabricated doctor's letters he circulated to other former players, according to the indictment, but several red flags in the documents drew people's attention uh, because there was grammatical errors and misspellings of patients' names Mm -hmm. in the paperwork. Um, Also, according to the indictment, uh, there was invoices for treatment uh, where they claimed they received, well, there was invoices for treatment when the actual people who received the treatment were either out of state or out of the country. Mm -hmm. Um, Essentially, according to uh, Audrey Strauss, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, the defendant's playbook included fraud and deception. The players will have to answer for their flagrant violations mm-hmm. of the law. So when I say all this, what do you say? Take that shit to motherfucking trial. Shout Take out to that young shit thug. to motherfucking trial. <laughs> That's all it. That's okay. all I got to say. Ain't no talking. Ain't no cooperating. You know, this situation is the NBA didn't do their due diligence. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, you're just put in a situation where you're associated. And so now I got to go to trial because they think I did something that I know I didn't do. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That I know that I'm innocent. You know what I mean? Um, the whole situation, I never got any money. Wow. That's the thing. No money. I but you're a part of this indictment. I'm a part of this indictment. So are you on bail right now? Yeah. Okay, so you get charged. And what's the bail amount? Uh, I didn't, it wasn't no, I don't think it was no bail. I didn't have to pay nothing. Right. You're not was, exactly a danger to society yeah, or a like flight risk to, or yeah, anything I else didn't like that. I didn't have to that. pay nothing or anything like that. But uh, yeah, it was just a, now you're in a certain group, you know, and now they want to just tag us all in when it's not that. It's people taking you know, advantage of the situation. So I just, I'm going to trial because I didn't do anything. Okay. Are they offering you plea deals? Uh, they haven't talked to me yet. Well, I'm not talking to them. I'm not, I'm not doing no. Right, well, you, you lawyered know, up, I'm sure. I'm lawyered up and yeah. I'm, I'm going to trial. I'm fighting. Okay. I'm sorry I have to go through that. Oh, ain't nothing. I'm, I'm going to get my money. The NBA ain't going to owe me because it's some bullshit. Some bullshit. Some really, really bullshit. I'm sorry to hear you going through it. Oh, it's okay. You know, good people go through things sometimes. But now it's just, I got to learn, you know, people around me. I got to really look at paperwork. You know, that's the thing about being an athlete and coming back down to the real world, that they expect you, you know, to be able to go, you know, do these things when you need help. I've always had gaps, learning disabilities and situations like that. I just always made it off the intuition of me as a person and my character. That's how I made it through life. So, you know, this situation happened is, you know, you got to be mindful. You got to know that you got health insurance. You got to know that you got to file these pieces of paper. You can't just go and, okay, I'm going to work out because I think I know. No, you got to, you got to go right and, and pe- you know what I mean? Like, and that's something I was new coming back down to the world and being an athlete and not having, you know, those people trying to help us and adjust. So that's, you know, that's that type of situation. And, you know, I never, ever got it done. So I'm fighting that. You know what I mean? Because they throw me in there like, oh, for me, no, I never got it done. So, right. And you're essentially the biggest name in that whole indictment. Everybody knew me. Right. Like I was like, I would go places, but like, oh, that's Big Baby. Like, oh, Big Baby, you. I'm like, bro, I never got a dime. Damn. I never seen a dime. Like, wow. It's crazy. Fast forward to this year, 2022. Uh, you were actually there when the Boston Celtics retired Kevin Garnett's jersey. Yeah. And you actually saw him cry yeah. for the first time ever. Yeah. How did that feel? Because that was your OG, essentially. I was so happy. Hmm. I was so fucking happy to be there, to know that I was a part of his life. You know, when a guy takes a part you know, he had so many dealings and, you know, so many, so many parts of his life, you know what I mean? And to take a part of me and put it in your book, you know what I mean? Like that was special to me, you know what I mean? So when his jersey got retired, um, I, I had to be there. Because at one point, Kevin Garnett had to sue his accountant for $77 million. Mm-hmm. You know about the story? Mm-hmm. From your point of view, what what happened? Because you hear, I mean, I interview a lot of professional. It's what players. I just talked about. It's about athletes being on a pedestal, right? For a guy like that, didn't graduate, what, barely high school? Went straight out of the lead to high school? Mm-hmm. And now he gets all this money? Hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions of dollars? Yeah. And now you have one person that is there operating his money, and he is a boss, but he's a boss in a different way. When you talk about, you know, uh, a spreadsheet to KG, he, he might sound crazy. You talk words to him, he might not pronounce the words right, but he's passionate, he's intellectual, he understands. So that's where he's a master at. On the other side, this money stuff, no, he just swiping. He just, he ain't, hey, every, you know what I mean? It, it wasn't like that. And, you know, giving somebody full range like that, you know what I'm saying? They take advantage of. Oh yeah, power of attorney is always that that term I hear that people seriously yeah. regret. I remember like Eddie Curry when I interviewed him, uh, he had a similar situation where he had like this accountant, whatever, money manager, power of attorney who took out these loans he didn't know about yeah. from like Vegas. And next thing you know, this 
half million dollar loan is like $6 million and with crazy interest rates. And now you got to take a loan from your future salary to pay back that loan. And you just hear the story over and over again. That was one of the biggest things, biggest factors in my financial just ruin, bro, is that I, is that I gave someone power of attorney. And I remember at one point, like, I, like toward the end of my time in New York, probably my last year there, man, um, he had he had got a loan from this dude in uh, Vegas, and they didn't have any. There was no laws on. There was no cap on, just the inflation, just the extra the the like the late fees, late penalties, and shit like that that you can charge for a loan. He took out a loan. He used a, a stamp of my signature to get the loan. He defaulted on the loan. I didn't even know about it. Didn't get the proceeds from it or anything. They ended up taking me to court. It was like a five hundred thousand dollar loan. I ended up having to pay like four million dollars on this loan. And- yeah. Uh, Gilbert Arenas. Yeah, he had his accounting firm. He had to sue them, yeah. and he won. Like, yeah, because we're athletes, and as we're athletes, we don't prepare ourselves for the business world. You know, you know, for 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 young athletes that are going through situations and get money on your way out, even in your end, you're supposed to be thinking about what you're going to do when you're out. Mm-hmm. Some of us we don't. Well, most don't. We don't. We don't. I mean, listen, I. I remember Booby Gibson. I remember Booby told me something really interesting in our first interview. He said that in all the locker rooms he's been in, he's never heard players, you know, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars are in the room, Uh right? He's never heard players talk about their business decisions, joint business moves, joint this, you know, nothing. stocks that they're buying, Never. you know, they're talking about cars, they're talking about girls, buying, they're talking about jewelry. We gambling. But nobody is Thousands seriously going like, okay, look, our careers might be over at the end of tonight. Hey, bro, let's do this. Hey, bro, let's no, do this. Nobody talks no, about that. And, no. and, and you can confirm that. I can confirm that. Yeah. Nobody does that. Which is crazy to me. It's beyond crazy. Right. Because you think about money, you know what I mean? Think about money. The NBA comes and tells us this and that and that because they want our money back. Hey, you got this 401k. We're going to match it. Hey, get it. We want that money back. You know what I mean? Like, meaning that the fact that like... Well, matching a 401k doesn't mean the money back. But no, but just the fact that, you know, like health insurance, NBA gets all that. So they offer that. Like, hey, 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 hey. But as players, we don't offer, hey, I got, I got this apartment complex in Stanford by this college, you know, might take four years, five years, just gonna, you know what I mean? It's going to come back. We're not doing that together. Yeah, yeah you're not putting money into S&P 500. We're, 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 yeah. we're, we're not. Which is too bad because I know me, I've gone broke before, uh-huh. right? And I always like, in my DVR, when I had a DVR, I always had ESPN's 30 for 30 broke, that uh-huh. episode. And I would just rewatch it every so often to just remind myself that, hey, I could lose all this. Yeah. You know, and, and watching these guys, some of which I've, I've interviewed. Yeah. Um, like uh, Le- uh, Left Eye's uh, boyfriend. Um, what, what was Football his name? Player. Yeah. Andre um, Risen. Andre Risen. Yeah, I mean, he went totally, he was on that show. He went totally broke. He had an entourage of like 15 people. Yeah. 15 grown men that he would fly out with him, put them in hotels, pay for their food, take them shopping as if these are his children. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, now he's left holding the bag and he's broke and they're all gone. Yeah. Did you ever have the big entourage? Not a huge entourage. But a few people. But I I was outside. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you're guilty of it a little bit. Uh, yeah, I no question. I'm pulling up, big baby, he ordering yeah, bottles 22 for bottles every time he pulls. That's his signature thing. Woo. 11 bottles. And how much is that? Maybe about 15,000. You know, depending 000. on where you at. Yeah. Vegas, that's my me. 25,000. Exactly. <laughs> Miami, that might be 15. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, right. So you're doing it every time you go out. You and that know. money's gone. Poof. Oh, yeah. You you treating, you know what I mean? You love your hoes, so you you take care of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the ball, ball, hoes. Like, <laughs> I'm dropping the bag on them, too. Like, it, yeah. It's just what it is. It's the lifestyle, you know? Well, uh, you know, this year the Celtics, uh, you know, are doing well. They're playing Brooklyn. Uh huh. You're there. Yeah. And I guess you were in the wrong seat. <laughs> okay. I know, right? I was, right? <laughs> the seating people, right? Somebody was sitting in my seats. So 
when I was there, I was like, which one's mine? And the guy was like, oh, sit here. They're not going to tell me I can't sit there. You know what I mean? But it was really somebody else's seats. I didn't look at my ticket. Okay. So I was sitting in the seats, and then I'm talking to KB, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then they're like, oh, the people for the seats before came back. And so I just moved, like, my seat was, like, right behind it because mm-hmm. somebody was in my seat. So I was... That was that situation. But Celtics love me, man. They know they ain't going right. to give me no bougie shit. Like, well, uh, but KD started trolling you. Oh, he was fucking with me. He was like, those ain't your seats, big dog? Those ain't your seats? Yeah, he was fucking with me. He was fucking with me. You know, we were fucking with each other. I asked him about, like, Kyrie. And he was like, I don't care. I could do this shit by myself. He said that? Yeah, he said that on the court. I was like, okay. Okay. I, He's out of here now. <laughs> He's right. To... Well, they got swept. Yeah, they got swept. Big time. Uh, didn't Kyrie tell the Celtic fans to suck his dick? Yeah, he tripping. <laughs> he tripping. The man tried to step on Lucky Face. Right, he disrespected the logo. Yeah, disrespected the logo. And you said that was karma. Yeah. Ain't no question. But he used to be a Celtic. Yeah, why would you do that? Mm. Why would you do that? That was just, That was stupid. I don't think KD, I don't think K Kyrie knew what he was doing at that time. Okay. I think he was tripping. I mean, when you look at, you know, that dynasty that was supposed to happen in Brooklyn, mm-hmm. KD, Kyrie, James Harden, that was supposed to be like the next level of the NBA. Uh-huh. And look what happened to it. To shit. Gone. I mean, people are saying this is one of the biggest, like, sort of catastrophes that a team has put together at this point. I yeah. mean, would you would you agree with that? I would I would agree with that. Mm. I just honestly think their chemistry just didn't sit well. Well, Kyrie not playing for like most of the most of the season didn't help. Yeah. I mean, they still made it to the playoffs, but like he didn't get to play with the team most of the season because he didn't want to get vaccinated. He tripping. He tripping. I, I, think, I agree. I think he tripping. Yeah, I feel the thing about Kyrie, I, I remember um I, I was talking to uh, uh, you know one of my friends about this. Is that I feel like Kyrie thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. That he feels that he knows all these things that all everyone else around him, all these millionaires and billionaires, just they're not smart enough to get. Yeah. I mean, and he is a great basketball player, but he's not the smartest guy in the room. Yeah, the Earth is not flat. Yeah, you know the vaccine. Will will you know? <laughs> will not kill you yeah. a year yeah, from now. That's what I, that's this is not the Tuskegee Airmen experiment, like the Tuskegee uh, experiment. Like, so so he makes these moves, and I mean, it's, it's kind of ironic that he gets swept by the team that he left. Mm, oh my God! Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm just, just right. karma. Yeah, always going to have bad karma when it comes to the Celtics. Mm. I honestly think so, right? Because I think he went there with the wrong. He went there with the wrong mindset. Do you and think that the, the Celtics would have? Uh, imagine the, Kyrie on that damn team. Well, right that's what now. I'm saying. Do you think the Celtics would have won that year? Imagine, see, Jason and Jalen wasn't ready. Right, still young. Yeah. So if you didn't know, that's why people don't know this. After KD and them won the championship, I seen Jason Tatum and Kyrie Irving at a table with KD in the Bahamas. They just won the championship. Kyrie was trying to get KD to come to Boston. Mm. When Boston didn't work out, when Boston didn't work out, KD, come to Brooklyn. KD was gonna go to Boston. I seen him with my own eyes in the Bahamas. I was like, why y'all sitting at the same table? I didn't even walk over there. I was like, that's crazy. KD was trying to come to Boston. And so now Kyrie gets all fucked up in Boston. Danny doesn't work out. They really can't deliver. Tatum, Jalen's not doing what, you know what I mean? They lost the playoffs. Kyrie bolts. Going to Brooklyn. Let's go to Brooklyn. KD goes over there. Yeah, I mean, it's really ironic that after the finals, I mean, essentially the Warriors beat the Celtics and KD gets to watch as his old team, who he just left, is winning, wins the championship yeah. without him. And this is not a, a shot at KD because he's phenomenal uh-huh. at what he does. Uh, you know, he just DM me the other day, tell me how much of a fan he was of of what I do. 
Uh, so I, I think KD, I've always thought KD was dope, but had he stayed, he'd have another ring. No question. I mean, how'd you feel when you saw the Celtics lose to the Warriors? I felt, you know, I wasn't happy, but I was happy. Really? Why is that? Reason why is because there's different levels of the playoffs. Every level is a different level. First round is the first round, but energy is a different level, right? You know, different teams, but every level is so important. And now you guys understand the feeling of winning a Eastern Conference Finals. You know what it takes. You know what it takes to go to the finals, but then you know what it takes to, you know, it to close now. What the energy we got to have, what you got to be able to do. You know what I mean? And that experience is just, it's, it's the, with the right guys that experience it, they're going to win a championship, right? Because they hate that feeling of losing. So now you understand. So I was happy for that learning experience and the future's bright when you got Jalen Brown and mm -hmm. Tatum really being all stars. Yeah. I remember I interviewed uh, Iman Shumpert and when he played with LeBron in Cleveland, he talked about how much he hated the Warriors because he felt like they kind of changed the game in a way. You know what I mean? You actually said you, you hated that team. Yeah. You were playing them. Oh yeah. I was supposed to hate them. <laughs> the, the basketball guys told me to hate them. I was supposed to hate them with all my heart. I mean, what was it about them you hated so much? They was a different version of basketball. They did. Like no one was dominating the game with a bunch of threes yeah, until, you know, until they came around. Yeah, yeah, they did. They did change the game in a different way. But I just think at times, you know, it, it's a perfect example of this is why we got to have the right GMs and the right ownerships. Because you think about their draft picks. They drafted all those guys. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They drafted all those guys. And so the genuine, you know, the genuine love that they have for each other is just, it just overpowers yeah. so much. You know, KD can come, KD can leave. We still capable of doing it. And right. so- Steph is still there. Yeah, Draymond and, is still there. Yeah, so Clay they, is still there. These it, guys aren't jumping around. Yeah, It's everything. Mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, Clay and Steph. You know what I mean? It's fucking Dre. It's fucking Looney who goes in there and does his job and shuts the fuck up, don't say shit. It's Andre Iguodala that comes back. It's those parts. Yeah, it's Steph and Wade. He's great, right? Clay is great at shooting. But you look around, it's, that's it, really. It's just the genuine love in, for each other. You know what I mean? That's what's helping them win these championships and the selfless shit that goes on. Draymond is one of the most selfless players I've ever met in my life. He'll pass up a layup to throw it to one of the greatest players to ever shoot the basketball. <laughs> That's simple. Like, you know what I mean? So it's just, it's, 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 you, you would think, you know, of it as a gumbo. Like, there's different pieces. This piece tastes good. This piece good. This piece good too. But when it's all together, it tastes like one thing. You know, so I think that's what they've got right now. And no matter what they add to them, they'll they'll be there. They'll be fighting. Somebody's going to have to, you know, kill them to, to get, them, <laughs> get them out of the playoff run. I mean, do you feel that Steph Curry needs to be in the GOAT conversation oh, no. at this point? Because historically, I feel like people have left him off that list. People always talk about Jordan. People talk about LeBron. People talk about Kobe. But they don't put Steph in that same conversation of those four people because of what he just did the finals mvp and that's how fucked up people are the man can win mvp of the league he can do all this break all type of records but if he doesn't get that finals mvp he's not considered a jordan he's not considered a magic johnson you know what i mean because you think about it that's the only thing that kept him out of the talk Right, but now he's got one. Now he's got one. So you, <laughs> what are you gonna say? When Steph pull up, you 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 gotta hi, Yesaya. 
Are you <laughs> like King Steph? Like forever? Like you know what I mean? When he pull up, you he definitely a king for sure. So you're getting into boxing now. Uh-huh. We saw the last time that a, a basketball player got in the ring. Yeah. Nate Robinson and Jake Paul. Do you know Nate Robinson at all? It's my boy. That's your boy. What was it like to see your boy in that ring? Tough. I was sick. I mean, as a as someone who boxed a little bit when I was younger and is a big fan of boxing, as soon as that fight started and I saw what he looked like in that ring, the first thing I thought was like, he didn't train. He didn't spar. That's what I'm saying. He didn't spar. He didn't get in the ring and spar. actually learn the rhythm of boxing. Yes. It almost seemed like he was counting on him being strong and athletic, athletic to get him through it. And, oh, this is just some white boy who probably can't fight. Mm-hmm. And he learned very quickly that that was not the case. First of all, Jake Paul is an animal. Yes. He is an insane, passionate, country boy, <laughs> fed. <laughs> like, he the white boy that is with the black guys. You know what I mean? Like, he's one of those guys. You meet, you know what I mean? Like, the way he is, like, takes on every challenge. So that's, first of all, that's where he's just as good as an athlete as Nate. Mm-hmm. So now when you go him boxing for more, you know, days than Nate, right? Nate, you know, in order to catch up to him, the only thing you really can do is spar. Right. Right? You got your basics as far as what you need. Right. Then you got your combinations. But then it's like, oh, I got to go out there and put that shit, mix that shit up. I got to jab, jab to the jab, jab. Oh, faint down to the jab body. Now I got to go up to the top with the right overhand, right to the head. Like he didn't get all that shit. Like, you know what I mean? And so, um, you know, I've been boxing and training MMA for 11 years. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. You know what I mean? A lot of people don't know that. I don't. Um, yeah. Dana White's a good friend of mine. He's you know, let me train in the UFC facility for years. You know, Skip Kelp, uh, Lewis, uh, all motherfuckers that like, you know, MMA guys helped me. Uh, um, Michael Lewis, I mean, um, you know, Dana's always been a good friend of mine. I've been in the boxing world, you know, boxing, wrestling, you oh. know, jiu-jitsu, so. Okay, so you're not going to be. Yeah, I ain't no, I ain't no. <laughs> I know, I know <laughs> newbie. It, it's like okay, and, and so you're fighting on the undercard of, of Jake Paul's fight, which which was recently canceled well, and recast well, with someone else, right? Well, yeah. So I'm fighting. I was gonna fight on the August card of okay. six, but we're gonna fight on the December card. There's a December card coming, and um, we're gonna fight on that one. I'm supposed to be. I think it's either Roy Nelson, the UFC fighter, or it's gonna be. Some ex uh, globe trialer guy. I'm gonna fight him. Okay, the the UFC guy is he your size? No. Okay, he's like about six feet five eleven. Okay, he's big like, country. He's... Roy Nelson. Okay, so it's not gonna be like a Lamar Odom versus Aaron Carter kind of nah, <laughs> situation. Nah, nah. Just, some, just some real, just some real, some shit, real shit going on. I'll probably beat the shit out of Lamar Odom. Oh yeah, I probably you gonna put that out there. Okay. I probably I can see the that. shit out of him. Okay. He's so, too, so you're calling out Lamar Odom in the ring right now. I, that is not fair. I, 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 I'm picking on him if I do that. Like, <laughs> I mean, he's a big guy, though. I mean, he's what? He's a seven-footer, right? Lamar is. He's a little thinner than you. Thinner? <laughs> Boy, <laughs> like a damn, <laughs> uh, 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 a damn skin pin, man. That man is skinny as hell. Imagine me punching that man in the head, man. That's like. <laughs> crushing a gusher. <laughs> okay. But if you got offered that fight, would you do it? Beat the shit out of him. Beat the shit hey, out of him. Hey, I mean, there we go. Said. Lamar Odom. I've interviewed you before. Yeah. You know, we know each other. Him. Beat the shit out of him. Sixes. Big baby's calling you out in the ring. After you're done with Big Brother or whatever the hell you're working on right oh, now, come come see these hands. Yeah. <laughs> in the ring. <laughs> can poop on itself again. <laughs> Dookie. Okay. And... Have you started your comedy tour yet? Yeah. Okay. So I've been in Boston. Good for you. By the way, comedy is something I've always wanted to do as well, but you've actually <laughs> taken upon yourself to actually do it. Yeah. Good for you, man. Yeah. So uh, comedy's always been like 
something, been a part of my life, any type of way. I've always been a funny guy, always making people laugh. Uh, my career on the court was funny, you know, energetic. And um, I was just sitting back and I was just like, man, I think I should try this comedian thing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, you go up to open mics and you see steady going, you know, I keep going. And Okay, so you were doing open mics? Open mics, yeah. Were you getting booed at all? I never got booed. Okay. Well, never the, got booed. the year's not over yet. I know. <laughs> See, I got booed. I know. He, <laughs> he, he suck right now. He, uh, he needs some coaching right now. He, oh, you, you don't think he's funny on stage? Uh, you know, it's his premises. Like, when you're a comedian, you got to have a premise, like, of a joke. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like the setup. You yeah. know what I mean? His setups are not like, you know? It's just like, he's always just talking, you know? And then also... We want to hear T.I. experiences, not this or that. What your experience is, T.I., you might have to talk about yourself. Right. You know, you might have to make fun of, you know, all these girls. You know, you got to do, you know. So well, right. Remember that one female comedian was basically making fun of the, oh, yeah. the, the rape accusations. And, and, and he, like, a, he like approached her and was mad at her and called her a bitch and everything. And it's and, like. Yeah. Well, man, if you're doing comedy, what you need to do is get on stage and answer that shit back you in a comedic a, a, way. You got ah with that. You got an ah ah, yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like you got to run up on someone over a, uh -huh. a joke you don't like. Yeah. You know? That's how you know it's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. The motherfucker get that back or call the motherfucking bitches all. Goddamn, T.I. Oh. You, you, what you so bad for, man? Goddamn. Okay. You, just, you just won the case, right? Did you won the case? Did you win? <laughs> <laughs> then you win, buddy. Why you why you calling this girl bitch up here? Why you sensitive about it? Yeah, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and actually, what's interesting, me and you were talking outside before the interview. You come and tell me that you have a, a store, I guess, in, in New York. Yeah, I have a um, a okay. store in New York. What kind of store is it? It's basically a cannabis store. Where basically, it's all kind of like a networking place. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty good spot, man. Um, because right, you can sell weed legally in New York. Sort of, kind of. Kind of, sort of. I remember last time I bought weed, it was from like a van <laughs> like yeah. near Times Square. And actually turned out to be pretty good weed. I remember the yeah. guys were telling me like, well, it's kind of gray area right now. So. Yeah, it's a gray area, but we're like more like a social club. Okay. And so, um, you know, um, we have like young, you know, young entrepreneurs and young people that are talented in all type of ways. It's a place they come and, you know, kind of collect and build. And so, um, yeah, we have a little marijuana products and stuff like that. It's just personal gifts and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But um, it's a great place. You right. know, it's kind of culture. I got a podcast about it, um, you know, where we bring in all types of artists, uh, you know, special people, anybody that's doing anything unique, dope, and fun. Um, and then also we give an educational piece because right now it's hard for, you know, FDA to regulate these things. And so when we come from an educational piece, people feel comfortable fucking with us instead of going to a, a smoke shop. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And like going to smoke, and like, what is this? Oh, no, you go into this place where you can get a podcast about the smoke that's in here or whatever you're smoking. And, um, you know, we get that too for our, our members and stuff like that. So it's a pretty cool place. What was interesting about this place is who's doing security. Yeah. <laughs> and that is? <laughs> yeah. Um, Blue. Blue Boy. Blue Boy. Who uh, I interviewed and introduced to the rest of the world. Uh -huh. uh, one of our biggest interviews this year, uh, who has killed three people uh -huh. that we know of. Yeah. Uh, two, you know, one person on the outside, two on the inside, including Larry Davis, uh -huh. uh, who got out recently after doing 30 years. Uh-huh. Uh, and he's doing your security. Yeah, he's, you know, we have merch and stuff like that. And people come in that don't really, not supposed to be there. And he's he's just there scaring people. <laughs> 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 you know, he's really, he stays on the outside. He never really comes in. Like, you know, it's, you know, it's a social club. So, you know, he he's just a good person to be in there if shit goes bad. Like, <laughs> uh, Yeah. Yeah, I feel safe with Blue Boy around. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, he's uh, he's a very interesting figure, and I, I wasn't familiar with him until you know they, they brought him to me. Uh -huh. And once we did the interview, like I think like five million people watched it at this point, and it's just like 
I never realized how big of a figure he was in New York. Yeah, he's 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 huge in New York, and I I like it because you know you got a guy that was in jail for a long time. Yeah, most of his life. And it's hard for him to get a job. Of course. So even if he comes and take the trash out, you know what I mean. Even if he comes and you know put water in the refrigerator, you know what I mean. Like, and just having his presence around because of the knowledge and stuff that he knows is the best thing. You know what I mean. So. You know, he comes, does his little job, and he gets out of there. He don't really stay and hang out, you know what I mean? But he does make it a point of time to sit there and talk. And, you know, I learned a lot from him, you know what I mean? He's just a good person to be around, man, and just just that wisdom, you know? Right, and you're wearing a Virgil. Oh, my God, what happened to Virgil? A WWE Virgil <laughs> Photoshop. <laughs> Shirt, can I go ahead and see it? Can you pull it down a little bit? Yep, he's got the, the yeah, Louis Vuitton man, brand yeah, on his arm. Yeah, uh, man. I don't think he was actually looked like that in real life, but no, 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 man. This is uh, my <laughs> man B Woods. Oh, uh, they got some good clothing in New York. I That's bought this I... sweatshirt in New York. Did you ever meet Virgil? No, me neither. I wish I would. I mean, Virgil, uh, I felt like he was the first uh, black fashion designer that finally broke that glass ceiling uh -huh. to being not viewed as just a hip hop clothing label guy. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, you've seen it happen over and over again. Like I've interviewed Carl Kanai. Uh -huh. I've interviewed the guys that started Cross Colors. Uh -huh. uh, you know, obviously we know the FUBU story and so forth. And these guys all build up these brands that are super popular in the hip hop community. And then at one point, it just falls out of favor for whatever reason. Uh -huh. And it never stays and never sort of gets uplifted to the very highest levels mm -hmm. in, the, in the same way that like he became the, you know, creative director of Louis Vuitton and then Louis Vuitton actually bought, mm -hmm. you know, Off-White. So it'll be around long past, you know, his, his life, which is already happening. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? I feel like the other brands have hit a ceiling and then people just stop fucking with it. Like Virgil never hit that ceiling. And I feel like mm -hmm. Off-White's gonna be around for for years and and you see what happens with like, like for example, like the the Air Force One Louis Vuitton collabs mm -hmm. that he put together yeah, are selling huge. for like, how much, like 30, 40,000 or something like huge, that? Huge, it's huge. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was just big, just for the, the culture. And you know, it's just crazy how the way he went out because we no, really, no. We really couldn't give him his flowers because we didn't know. And now, you know, I think that right there, because of the way he did that, we'll always give him his flowers for the rest, right? He didn't like make everybody feel sorry for him. He went, did his job. Yep. And then next thing you know, I'm sick, I'm gone. Here you go, this is what I left. Boom. You know what I mean? So it's just like, yeah. you know, when somebody, you know, and then, you know, it's just, I just like how the way he did that. You can just tell the type of person he is, you know, um, and just what he did for the culture, for yeah. our culture, you know, it's just huge, you know. Yeah, rest in peace. Rest in peace. Rest Virgil. in peace, Virgil, man. Uh, he, he made a mark. Yeah, he did. Well, big baby, man, can, you know, appreciate you coming in. Thanks, man. Uh, Thanks, you, you, man. You've done, it, you've done it your way. My the way, man. You know, you haven't compromised. Yeah. Uh, you know, coming out of Baton Rouge, in a situation where you don't know your father, your yeah. mom is on drugs, you end up in foster care at one point, uh -huh. uh, you could have really just been a statistic yeah. at this point. You, Your trajectory was not meant to put you right here, yeah. right now in this room. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of your friends who you grew up with, some of which were probably as talented, if not more talented than you in their own way. Yeah, so true. Just, just got caught up yeah, in, in life and, and never got to make it. Yeah. Uh, and you've really beat the odds. And um and even even with the rough patches, I feel like you're you're okay. Mm -hmm. You know, you 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 made some mistakes along the way, you blew your money like mm -hmm. we've all done, but you didn't end up in bankruptcy and, uh, and all this other bullshit that you find a lot of other athletes yeah. run into. Like I'm you know, outside. you still have businesses, you're still doing your thing, mm -hmm. uh, you're healthy. Mm -hmm. Uh and uh I, I mean that that's what we all strive for. Yeah, man. 
Yeah, you know, man. you got a you got an NBA ring. Yeah. And uh man, you have you have some great experiences with some of the best players that have ever stepped on that court. Yeah. And I'm excited, man, about this new career. You know, acting has been it's been dope, man. So I'm so excited about, you know, upcoming shows I have. I can't spoil them because you know it's gonna yep. be crazy. So no doubt. Big baby, until next time. Thank you. Peace. Man.